Hey, welcome back to this old tool room milling machine. I got a new old mill. This is a 1968 vintage Deckel FP1 tool room milling machine. For those not familiar with those machines, we have a general layout of a column. This is a massive casting here with spindle speed gearbox and power feed gearbox down here. I will bring in the camera later so you can see the, the feed and speed selection. We have a layout with a ram up here, moves back and forth. This is the y-axis of the machine. I have a saddle that moves side to side. This is a power feed axis. We have full power feed from end to end. And we have a C-axis that moves the saddle up and down like this. Also power feed axis, so you can use this to do boring in the C-axis. What makes these machines so universal is the fact that they don't have a fixed mounted table. They have this vertical surface with two T-slots that you bolt your accessories to. Like in my case, I have a two axis swiveling indexing head bolted to it. There is also a rigid, just a 90 degree angled table, which looks like a large angle plate to be honest, which you can bolt on here. There is a swiveling, tilting and rotating table for it. There is a spiral milling attachment that you can bolt on here if, you, if you're keen to make your own drills and end mills and stuff like that. So you can rough them out on the mill, harden them and grind them. There is a huge rotary table with 340 millimeters. That's usually put on the rigid table or you can bolt it vertically against the surface here. I think that's most of the options that you have for, for this face. Or if you work on large parts, you can bolt the large parts right up against this face here. Very useful layout here. For example, if you work on a large plate and you need to drill the, the face, you can bolt the plate up against here and drill with the vertical spindle into the plate. Good option here. Another thing is those machines have a vertical spindle with a quill, which is nice for drilling. It's a little bit anemic on a travel side. It's only 60 millimeter travel, but you have the C axis with power feed to compensate for that. And you can also take this head, swivel it by 90 degrees to both sides if you want to do angled work, angled drilling. And you can take this head off. You open these two screws, pull it a little bit forward and lift it off. It's bloody heavy, by the way. Then you have a horizontal spindle. Uh, both spindles are ISO 40, uses, uses a standard 40 taper tool with a special draw bolt. Um, I will, we will look into that later, but standard tooling with a special draw bolt that you can easily purchase. And when you have to head off, you can put on different heads on this machine. You can put on standard, standard geared vertical head. You can get a high speed head with its separate motor it goes up to 6,000 RPM. You can put a slotting head. You can transform this machine in a vertical slaughter. I have the slotting head, by the way. You can put on a jig boring head, which has power feet on the quill, a different bearing arrangement on the quill for high precision hole work. You can put on a chick grinding head, which uses electric high speed spindles on a uh, on a boring head like setup so you can put them off center and you can grind bores and uh, arc segments and things like that on this machine. It's not a jig borer from a precision standpoint but it can be pressed into that surface if you need to. It's not a it, it doesn't compare to a jig borer at all. Uh, there are too many geometric problems with the with this layout for being a jig borer. For example, if it, when you move the Y axis forward, it, it will start to sag. Less on an FP1 an issue, but on the larger machines that is an issue. And on the very large machines, they even scraped a little bit of a bow into the Y axis. So when you move the head out, it, it compensates for the sag. 
not so much on the on the small machines and you can also put a overarm support on it and do, put a, a long mill arbor in here and do like horizontal milling if you so desire i think that's all the heads for this machine so many 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 options the indexing head here is also iso 40 <laughs> Uh, there is a there is a a strong theme of similar tool shanks uh, throughout the accessories and the, the machine itself. We'll pull the vise off in a second. You will see how the vise is mounted, and then you can see the ISO 40 taper in the indexing head. Also, the ISO the indexing head has a overarm support, so you can do long shafts with it. It's, it's 40 to 1 geared and you can unhook the gearing and you have a 24 position direct indexing too. Currently I have a vice mounted on here so I'm just using it basically as a vice with a rotary base. Trying it out to see if this serves my needs for small part work well enough. At some point in time, I said that I will never buy a Decal FP1 tool or mill because the, the machine is expensive and the accessories and replacement parts are very expensive. And that's very true and that's painfully true. But I was looking for something different than a import machine for my next milling machine. And I was looking at the parts that I'm making and all the parts I made over the last years are small like fist size or smaller, most even thumb sized. And therefore the small travels of this machine match my needs very well. And from a business standpoint, I need a good milling machine. And if something breaks on the milling machine, I need to be able to get replacement parts quickly. I have three of the major rebuilders for decal machines in my area. It's like a two hour drive to them and I can get like a replacement head for this machine in a day, which is very nice. Yes, it's expensive, but I can get them. If I bought something like a Shoblin 13, things look different. Shoblin manual tool room mills are rare here in Germany and replacement parts or spare parts are even more rare, rarer, rare, rare. So this, the, the FP1 just gives me the option to get the parts if I need them. And I didn't want to go for another import mill because I had to put a lot of work over the years. I had the mill for seven years and I put really a lot of work into it. I learned a lot with that machine, how to, to get a lot of precision out of a okay-ish machine. But it's time to move on. And this is what I move on to. <laughs> so I think that's my justification for this machine. And in the life of every precision machinist or mechanic here in Germany, there is the time when he has to get a FP1. It's like midlife crisis. Some people buy a uh, motorboat. I bought this thing. The devices are mounted with four radial screws and you will see in a second how this works. You just loosen them. and you lift it off. You have <clears throat> you have those conical screws here, four of them, that interact with this conical feature on this precision diameter. The other precision diameter that matches the flange that I made very exactly and the screws are offset a little bit to the top and when you tighten the screws the flange gets pulled down. There's about 20 microns radial play in, in the flange and when you tighten the screws it, it has the option to skirm around a little bit but once you have tightened it down it, it's solid in place. Yes there is a little bit of radial run out that you you can influence a little bit with the screws but to be honest you just put it on, tighten it, 
and then you adjust whatever you put on here for example if you put a flange with a chuck on it you just slide the chuck on the flange around until it runs true or you put a, a set true chuck on here or an independent four jaw chuck and now you also can see the ISO 40 taper here which matches all of the tooling doesn't make sense to put an end mill here but it makes sense to put for example an ER collet chuck in here or the decal these are these come with the machine uh, these are 20 millimeter shanked collets and a ISO 40 adapter sleeve this goes in here and this goes in here and you put a draw tube in from the back and this allows you to do work holding on small diameter round parts up to 6, 18 millimeters. Or you can put in a ISO 40 collet that goes up to 32 millimeters. Or you put a, a chuck on here or you have many options with this. There is a, a large 250 millimeter faceplate that Dackel made as an accessory. So we have or 40 to 1 gear drive here with a very nice dial here reading in one minute of arc 9 degree per full revolution and you have also the option to run index plate so you have the option to either use the the dial or you can lock the dial and use use the index plate But usually I need the for, for most work the graduated dial here is fine. We have two moving axes, two adjustments. Uh, there is a set of bolts that you need to loosen. This one, this is a tilt. This allows for about five degrees in both directions. This used to be used to mill punches and things like that for tool and die work. So this, this would be used to create clearance angles. And we have a second adjustment. Let's tighten this down again. We have a second adjustment, which is very useful. So we hold this and then we can oh yeah you need to remove this one bolt for it too and then you can move this whole thing up to 90 degrees to make the spindle horizontal or even further you can go back down again too. So let's put it at about 90 degrees. It has very nice styles and graduations for all the adjustments, but for precision work, you need to dial it in after you moved it. So now it's pointing that direction and it's over very far. So this is quite useless. So we can open this bolt, this bolt and down here too. And we can take it carefully and slide it over. and bolt it in place again. And now we have a horizontal spindle dividing head with a reasonable amount of travel out here to do shaft work. For example, if you need to mill a, a key slot in, in, a, in a shaft. 
But hey, you need to support a long shaft. That's true. For that, we have those two screws here. We loosen these, we pull out this cover. Oh. And this goes in here. And the tailstock goes on here. And suddenly we have an indexing head with a tailstock. And due to the fact that it can be tilted, you can do conical work too. And you have a lot of options with this. And the spiral milling attachment is a very similar setup. It mounts here in front of the table, but it's in addition driven off the table power feed. So you can do spiraling. This one is not. I bought the machine from a rebuilder. It's not a rebuilt machine, it's a used machine, but that's where I got it from. And I got it delivered on the truck with a crane, which made moving it into my shop very easy. We just craned it onto my paveway. And then I pallet checked it into the shop. It was like a 30 minute deal. A good friend helped me to get it into the shop and into place. But overall it was very little drama. <laughs> That's the things I can do with the indexing head. I'm not going to pull the indexing head and put the rigid table on because the rigid table is heavy. This is the machine how it arrived. It still had the rigid table mounted and also there's the crane in the picture. While I'm here breaking my back I will pull off the, t the head of the machine. So for the head we have a bunch of screws here that can be loosened to tilt the head. I'm not going to do that now. Just imagine the head sticking to the side. But we can loosen those up. These two screws here. Move this a little bit forward so it's in a nicer position to handle. then you look where you put the head when you have taken it off before you take it off otherwise you have this heavy head and no place to put it okay then it's just a matter of getting your arm under here there is a specific trick to do this without breaking your back and then you just slide the head forward about here and then you can lift it off it's of course easy when you're two meters tall and this is about <laughs> rest height. It's fairly heavy for small people to do this without hurting themselves. Then you just put this cover on here so no dirt falls in here. And then you have a horizontal mill. Pull the 40 taper plug out there and you have a horizontal mill. And with the horizontal spindle and the options of the table removed you have so many options to, to manipulate and work on a large part. So for example, you can take your face mill, put it in here. And like, I don't know, face a large angle plate or something like that. Well, within the travels of the machine, of course. It's still a 300 millimeter x-axis machine. It's not a huge mill. Oh, before you ask, the machine is about 600 and a little bit kilograms with the vertical head and the rigid table. The naked machine is 480 without a head or any table accessory. The machine has a coolant pump. It has a built-in coolant sump tank combination where all the coolant goes back and is pumped back up. The, the pump is driven off the main motor of the machine 
we have a coolant hose here, a lock line hose with a valve here, so you can use it. I'm still contemplating of putting coolant in the machine. I would like to. Modern coolants don't go bad as quickly as they used to. Not sure yet. So now we have the horizontal mill, but now the indexing head is useless, isn't it? No, it's not. If you go back, okay. Ooh. Okay, and now you have the option of doing long shafts with the vertical spindle. So that's your horizontal setup. I don't have the overarm support for long mill arbors because I don't expect that ever to be needed in my shop. Famous last words. I have the indexing head mounted to the vertical table of the mill and I'm drilling this large flange will, which will later be used to mount vices and chucks to the indexing head. And the way these are mounted, they require four radial drilled holes with an M10 thread. So I already drilled them and now I'm power tapping them. Power tapping on a Decal FP1 is a little bit different because you don't have a spindle reverse. So first we index our part. I'm using direct indexing in this case. It has a, I think it's 24 positions direct indexing function uh, combined with the 1 to 40 uh, warm gear indexing with whole plate. So 90 degree indexing. We have an index pin down here, Boop. indexed. Locking the spindle and we go into low range, 100 RPM quill is loose let it coast to zero get the gear into high range so we can easily spin the spindle then we just unwind it by hand This is gray cast iron, so we can't tap it without lubricant. Or you should even tap it without lubricant, otherwise you create a abrasive slurry. So for drilling those radial holes, I had this large flange bolted to a 22 millimeter stub mill arbor. The indexing head on this machine the indexing head on this machine is 40 taper. So it takes regular 40 taper tooling that also goes in the spindle, which is very convenient when you can change between work holding and tool holding with the same holders. It's not always universal, but it gives you more options. So let's get this on here. It's almost impossible to put it on without getting it There we go on then we find our conical features in the face of the indexing head here I disengage the worm now I can evenly tighten the set screws all around the indexing head like this 
and the screws dig into the well they don't dig into it uh, the spindle of this indexing head is bloody hardened and the set screws well they are hardened too but they're still a lot softer and we can just tighten these screws to a decent torque and now I can come back and drill hole patterns into this into this plate for example to mount a grinding vise onto it and then I have a fully rotational tilting and nodding vise on this machine or I was even thinking of making this an option it looks a little bit awkward and it's probably not crazy rigid it's probably comparable to using the universal table on this machine which is also not extremely rigid but this would work this this is not too far off this looks kind of reasonable ignore the screw heads i will get proper high strength set screws for this purpose i don't have any here at the moment so so there's that also uh, this will be able to go on here drill chuck or three jaw chuck also an er25 collar chuck that bolts directly to the face here a little bit of give so i can slide it around i have a small six jaw that could go on here i have many many options for this uh, with the indexing head here note that the machine currently has no digital readout so i'm using all the manual scales in combination with the large dials on the hand wheels i have to figure out the correct length and dimensions of scales that i need on this machine before i order something it's relatively slow but the dials and scales on here are very good and i can still do precise work that way
Now I have the slotting head on the machine. Just saw me put it on here. And as you can see, when I hand crank the machine, this ram moves up and down. And this is used like a shaper or in a vertical configuration, they are called slaughters. Slotting head. Uh, most, most used for keyways probably, but also nice to take out internal corners if you have to machine a square hole to cut splines. Uh, possibilities are endless. This head, well, was tightened down by a brute. So let's better take a proper wrench. Oh, that's interesting. You can't get a normal wrench in here. When you loosen the four screws on this flange here, this thing should rotate, and it does. I had to pull it forward a little bit to get my wrench in there. But as you can see, uh, we can do a... <clears throat> We can do angled slotting too. For example, if you need a keyway in a in a tapered bore that follows the wall of or follows the taper of the bore, you can do it either by tilting the slotting head or by tilting your table or your work holding fixture. Um, depends on what's easier to tram. In many cases, it's easier to retram for example, in a, a slotting head than a adjustable table or indexing head. This will take like five minutes to re to retram after I'm done because it's completely out of whack now. I moved every possible axis here. When I put the mill head back on, I don't need to retram it as long as all the surfaces are clean. So that's the slotting head. We can run it under power. You have to be extremely careful with this. There is no shear pin or overload protection in there. So if you crash it, you crash it. To adjust the stroke on the on this shaper head or slotting head, you move it in, a, in its lowest position by hand cranking the machine. Uh, like this, you, you just hand crank it into the lowest position, and then you go in with an hex key in front here. You loosen this screw, I think, yeah, it's counterclockwise. You loosen it, then you drop the same key in up here, and then you can adjust your stroke, and you can read the stroke length on this handy scale from 0 to 80 millimeters here on the side. So the slotting head can make up to 80 millimeter stroke or you can go as little as 0. So let's put it to 20 millimeters and see how this looks. I think it's important to retighten it. Probably very bad if you don't. And let's have it have it run. We start very slow. Okay, that's um, that's 40 strokes per minute. Let's go a little bit faster. That's 250 full strokes down and up, double strokes per minute. Uh, So 
So you're not supposed to run power feed with the slotting head because the, the stroke is not synchronous to the table feed and that means it will feed in constantly even when the tool is currently retracting and that will create a lot of force sideways force on the tool so uh, that's not recommended they say in the manual that you can do it on when you take a very slow feed and a relatively high sh uh, stroke stroke speed and the bending of the tool is is not an issue but yeah it's it's not good practice I don't think it's good, especially if you want to use a carbide slotting tool, which is always an option. So that's the slotting head. Very nice, very nice item. Let's put a let's put in a tool and slot something. And that's how you make a completely unnecessary feature in a aluminium plate. This was just for having some chips made for the video. <laughs> uh, just, just put in two 5mm keyways so you see the motion of, of hand feeding and the actual cutting action. And I have to say, I have used a shaper for cutting keyways. I have used a quill on a milling machine for cutting keyways and I used now this extensively like five minutes and I have to say it works. I'm probably still going to cut for example if I have a single aluminium hand wheel that needs a keyway I will still cut it with the quill of the milling machine just hand slotting it but the option of having the slotting head for major amount of work for example if I really have to cut a internal square hole and don't want to send it out for wire EDM, I can I can do that with the slotting head. It's, um, I, when when I purchased the machine and the accessories for it, I was thinking about options. The indexing head with with its adjustability gives me options. The tilting vertical spindle gives me options, the horizontal spindle gives me a ton of options and the slotting head adds another capability which I, I, I already had the capability of, of cutting internal features but this makes it easier if I'm using it extensively. I'm still of the opinion that a single key keyway with the quill is way faster even as you're hand actuating the quill to cut to take the cut it's faster than this because you have to take the mill head off you have to take put this on you have to to set up a tool this doesn't have a rotating spindle so finding center in a bore is more complicated
One concern I had with the setup with the indexing head and with a vice on top of it for general work was rigidity because it's a lot of stack up. We have the double angle plate that the indexing head hangs on. We have the spindle of the indexing head, the interface between the flange and the indexing head spindle. And then you have the vice which adds another layer of uh, non-rigidity to this whole setup. So I just took a piece of D2 tool steel and a 10 millimeter carbide end mill. And I'm not running crazy speeds and feeds. I'm running it at 800 RPM and the feed of 31 millimeters per minute, which is which is a feed of 10 micron per tooth per revolution. Okay, as you saw, this is a 10 by 10 millimeter cut, 100 square millimeter of cross section turned into chips. And I think that's, that's pretty much all I need to ask from this kind of setup on the, on the indexing head. The, I plan to use the setup mostly for small parts where no heavy material removal is asked for. And I hope that the ability to tilt it or to well, to rotate it, to tilt it to the side and then even nod it this way and combine it with the uh, tilting head of the milling machine. I think I can speed up some parts quite a bit by, by this whole contraption here. Let's talk tooling for the Deckel mill. As I said, it's a 40 taper machine, ISO 40 or here in Germany it's Steilkegel 40, uh, steep taper 40, steep taper because it's relatively steep taper compared to a Morse taper. Deckel used to sell accessories for the machine with that taper. Uh, you can still get them. I have some. This is an original Morse taper one uh, Deckel reducer sleeve and this is a short projection ISO 40 Morse taper two X, um, reducer with an internal screw that pulls the Morse taper two tool in. So I can use it for example with this uh, core drill or a rotor brooch holder. When you need new tools, you have the option just to buy a, a standard ISO 40 tool holder without a draw bolt. Um, this is a standard item used in CNC mills. You just put in your draw bolt in the back that you need for your automatic tool change, you're good to go. Or you buy a S20 by two buttress thread draw bolt put that into this tool holder and this makes it usable in any of the manual Deckel milling machines with a S20 by two draw bar. Deckel used a buttress thread, means it's, it's saw saw tooth shaped. In German, this is called a Sägengewinde, a saw tooth thread, because it looks like a saw. As you can see, I have stub mill arbors and mill holders. I have, I've only bought a few and I have a this is a weird one. This is a Wolhapte UPA3 boring head with a Morse tape of four, short, with a short Morse tape of four. Some, I think somebody cut it down. With an open, open ended 40 taper to Morse tape of four sleeve pressed onto it and with an S20 by two draw bolt in the back. So this fits the milling machine. It's a, it's a little bit of a, that's a little bit of a, combination here but should work perfectly fine and what's very classic work holding on the, on the deckel mills are these collets these are 20 millimeter shanked some 355e collets some call them u2 collets or deckel collets they have the same buttress thread and deckel used to sell this reducer sleeve which 
create which shapes a 40 taper on the outside and the colored taper on the inside then you just pull it into the spindle while a 40 taper or the steep tapers are not considered self-locking they will lock in a spindle if the taper is in good shape it, it can take quite some force to get the tools out if you ever heard a cnc machining center uh, change the tools it's quite a whack when the when the drawbar ejects the tool from the taper and in some cases when you run the machine very hot and le let it sit with the tool in the spindle the drawbar might not even be able to get the tool out of the spindle we had that numerous times same here this doesn't fall out of the spindle on its own so you take a large wrench and you just give it a, a good yank and it will come out of the spindle or you have this style of reducer sleeve for the taper collet seat and it has a, a draw nut so you can just use a hook wrench or a spanner a c-spanner and pull it out of the 40 taper these collets are very nice because they add very little length to the spindle nose they go from 0.5 to 18 millimeters and are suitable for light duty work you don't put a 12 millimeter roughing end mill and bury it in the cut uh, that will pull the end mill out of the collet try that for you it will happen but for light duty work like most of the stuff i do to be honest uh, these are cool these are very fast to change the the very coarse thread here makes changing them out very very easy um, if you need a short projecting drill chuck, you just have a cylindrical shanked 6mm Albrecht chuck. You put this in here and you're good to go. I also have a larger drill chuck. This is a 10mm uh, Röhm. This is directly on a B16 shanked adapter. This is more for larger drills. So this is a very fast way to change between tools. A face mill holder. Deckel sold a face mill for this machine, a 75 millimeter face mill, which is in my mind too big for this machine. I would not go over 50. I have this 50 millimeter one with inserts for aluminium, and I have a small one with 32 millimeters with inserts for steel. End mill holders are nice just for a little bit heavier roughing, and they're reasonably inexpensive. I don't have a single ER collet chuck yet for this machine. I probably will get at least a 16 and a 25 size and you will hopped uh, this comes courtesy of a very good friend of me he he dug this out of a dumpster <laughs> that's no joke this is straight out of a dumpster also i still have the small upa1 boring head which can go in this sleeve so i can do this is this is more suitable for smaller work it, it can run faster and it takes smaller tools so you don't need that large of a reducer sleeve so you have your 40 taper spindle you make sure that it's clean then you take your your boring head for example and you just thread it into the the drawbar the drawbar on these machines is captive it 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 it's not a removable you have to pull and you have to hammer out a small pin and then you can pull it out for that reason it will also eject the tool from the taper just uncrank it and then it will push the tool out of the taper seat they made this machine also with more taper four and there the captive drawbar is way more important than here so. and as you can see this uh, despite being a very large boring head we can crank the y-axis back far enough to be useful uh, this c-axis bellow if I'm the c-axis can go a little bit higher I think there are 40 millimeters or 50 millimeters more travel here if I had to crank it higher I would remove the the bellow because it compresses very hard and I don't want to bend it all up it's already not in the best of shapes 
but it's it's very nice to have this uh, this bellow with the sheet metal because it's easy to clean. As you can see, this gives me the option to run the boring head in horizontal mode, for example. Unfortunately, we don't have power feed in, in this direction. Still another option to do things. And we can get it out again. Or we put something like a face mill in here. This would be useful to face the side of a large, large plate or the end of a, lar of a long stick of material like this and we want to square the end. This would be an option. If it's, for example, if it's too thick to, to side mill it with an end mill in the vertical spindle. Or if you need to drill sideways, also horizontal spindle. You can get carried away on these machines with weird setups and having all the machine all out of, bent out all of shape. But that's also the beauty of these machines. Sometimes you have to say to yourself, stop, I can do this easier just by angling the part and device instead of getting it all out of tram and having to go back. Putting the, the original spindle protector back in place. One quick note about the operation of the machine. This is the, when you stay in front of the machine, this is the right side. And we have a selector up here. This is for spindle speed. This is always motor speed one and two. And we have two rings. The outer ring is, is this setting. Um, it, it's the faster setting and the blue setting is this inner ring. This is um, basically the bull gear making, making the machine very slow but giving a lot of torque. So let's say you want a thousand RPM. You go to here and you want the outer ring so you change this to here and you turn on with motor speed one. That's a thousand RPM. So that's a very fast way of, of changing speeds. Sometimes the gear, the gear me don't mesh perfectly. That's normal because it's not a synchronized gearbox. Then you have to wiggle the spindle a little bit, just like on any other geared spindle. Okay, and the lower wheel here is to set the power feed. We have feeds from very slow, like 10 millimeters. This is always millimeters per minute. We have 10 millimeters per minute all the way up to 500 millimeters per minute on, on the second speed of the motor. And that's the power feed, all controlled with one lever. You can even engage two at the same time. It's 
two at the same time. In theory, you would mill a 45 degree with the horizontal spindle that way, but it's not as useful as you might think. It's more, this is more used if you used a 500 millimeter setting like a rapid traverse to clear a fixture, then you can scoot the table out of the way and down very quickly without hand cranking. And that's basically all the, all the control elements. Hand wheel for the Y axis, X and C. Here we have a knob. This turns on and off the coolant pump. And behind this cover there is, well, let's look. This is funny because Deckel, not only the name of the company, but it also means uh, cover in German. So we remove this Deckel and we have the coolant pump in here and a oil glass. This is the oil for, I think the power feed gearbox. And here we have the coolant pump. A very nice cast cover here. Very nice cast Deckel. back on. Here is one setup that I'm using currently for a customer part and it's these bent pieces of pipe. This is capillary tube. They're bent on a fixture oversize and I need to cut them to length and I designed a fixture just in CAD that, that just requires me to cut the pipe flush with the end of the fixture on both ends and the pipe is the right length bend is correct, everything is in the right position because the pipe fits in the slot very closely. So uh, that's also something I'm doing, precision bending. <laughs> uh, and before you ask, a uh, handsaw, cutting a piece of wood. So this one is done and this is the last one, goes in. Uh, gauge block as a spreader piece, old gauge block of course, not a not a metrology piece. Clamp it in place. Running at 400 RPM. This is a 32 millimeter slitting saw, 0.6 millimeter wide, and I'm feeding 40 millimeters per minute. Power feed. I cut all pipes to length on this side. Now I need to change the setup to this side. And this is relatively easy since we are on the rotary table. Just backing off my spindle so I don't crash into it. Gauge block. So a little bit about the machine purchase. I decided to buy the machine from a Deckel rebuilder because that's somebody I can get parts and accessories to if I need to, or get help with the machine if something breaks that I cannot fix myself. So I got there, they had four machines lined up and went through all four of them and quickly decided on one of them. It was this one. It had no digital readout, it had 40 taper, two dials for speed and feeds, and the adjustable table, which I was not too keen on. So we agreed on replacing the table with the standard rigid table because the 
adjustable table eats a lot of height in C and also is not very rigid. Also, they replaced some of the old glasses, fixed two of the bellows, added a drawbar that was missing for some reason, and just gave the machine a general wipe down, oil change, made it ready to be used. Not a rebuilt machine, it's still a used machine. Here's the back side of the machine. It, it doesn't appear to be repainted. It, it looks like the original paint. The slotting hat that I got, got at some point repainted rather badly, but that's okay. Also, I, I had them to quote to me the machine with transport, with a crane, so I can lift the machine from the street onto my paveway into the shop so I just need to pallet check the machine and don't have to do any heavy rigging operations. When I purchased the machine I had a look at the ways. I checked the, the squareness of the X, Y and C to each other with a large square and an indicator. I put the test bar into the spindle, borrowed it from them. They were nice enough to, to borrow it to me. Uh, checked the run out of the spindle close and far away from the spindle nose it was spot on. The machine had been rebuilt at some point in its life. It's 1968 old machine. Had been re rebuilt and there is still in the middle of the way some scraping left and considering the depth of a scraping mark that's not a terrible worn machine. It's It has some wear in it that's for sure but it's not terrible. It will probably serve me many many years before I feel the desire to get a scraper to it. And this is, by the way, how the adjustable table looks on the underside. And you can also see how a linear scale on an FP1 needs to be mounted on the x-axis so it doesn't interfere with any of the accessories. You put it under the vertical table, not on the vertical table. I've seen the linear scale mounted onto the vertical surface very often and it's just dumb. And here is a view into their shop with, on, on the left side, you can see a large planer that's used to, to put the, the finish on the machine tables. They still do the planed table finish and compared to other rebuilders who grind the tables. They also have a way grinder, which is not in the picture. In the far right corner, you can see a bunch of manuals, mach manual machines that are for their in-house use to fix the machines. They do all, they do scraping, they do grinding, they do a complete rebuild of your milling machine. I didn't want to walk around with a camera and, and put it into their faces, but um, that, that's a picture I got and gives us an idea of how a <laughs> rebuild shop looks. That's the overall machine again. I tramped the indexing head back in place. Vertical head is back on. I added a machine light. Uh, I didn't buy the machine with a light and I didn't want to buy a proper machine light because those are not very bright usually, especially the old Waldma Waldmann style with the two incandescent bulbs in there. They are very non-bright and very expensive. So I bought a IKEA desk lamp and uh, put some correct paint on it. And this is with a 20 watt LED bulb in there. This is an excellent machine light. That's what I use on all my machines. Um, I really like them. And from, from an aesthetic standpoint, which is, uh, well, medium important, it fits the machine pretty decent. I'm, I'm very happy with this light. So I hope you enjoyed this overview over the Deckel FP1 tool room mill. I hope you, it gave you an idea what the European style tool room mill brings into a shop apart from cost. <laughs> Thank you all for watching and I'll be back.